Bob Pisani here. Welcome to ETF Edge, your go-to place for everything exchange-traded fund. A Bitcoin ETF, it just got a little more likely. I know we've been talking about this for years now, but folks, really it did get a little more likely. And that's because the Bitcoin ETF was approved in Canada, not in the United States, in Canada. But that may mean an awful lot for what's happening here. What does this do for the prospects of a Bitcoin ETF in the United States? Let's talk to the people who might know the answer to that. First, Soam Safe is the CEO of Purpose Investments. He's the fellow who got approval for that Bitcoin ETF over in Canada. Christian Magoon runs the Amplified Transformational Data ETF. That's B-L-O-K. They specialize in blockchain investing. He knows an awful lot about this subject. And Andrew McCormick from Wallach Beth Capital. He's our all-around expert on ETFs and on ETF trading. Gentlemen, thanks very much. So let me start with you. I understand your ETF is going to be trading tomorrow under the symbol BTCC in Canada. Is that correct? And, and would this be accessible somehow to U.S. investors? Yes, Bob. It's First off, thanks for having me on. And, and uh, look, we're really excited about this. It's going to start trading tomorrow. First in the world that will be physically backed. Uh, you know, basically a dollar invested will be backed by a dollar of, of real Bitcoin in our uh, cold wallets. And, um, and and this is a trade of security. So like any trade of security, it's available for anyone to buy uh, anywhere. Uh, it is a registered fund for Canadian investors uh, specifically. And um, but we're, you know, I'm sure we'll see institutional demand and interest uh, around this uh, from a global investor base. So if I'm sitting in the United States, just hold my hand a little bit. And I, I have an Amer I have a, a Schwab account or whatever, a, a, you know, broker account, would I be able to access that and buy it if I wanted to? Well, I think it really comes down to whether your brokerage uh, firm will allow you to buy, um, you know, securities that are not listed in the U.S. exchanges. So anything that's traded on a Toronto Stock Exchange or, you know, in many cases, some of the international exchanges. And I think if that is the case, then, you know, you'd be able to trade this security just like any other. Um, and uh, and we hope that, uh, you know, investors are able to achieve that. But but ultimately, it is to comes down to the brokerage uh, firm that they work with. Yeah. Um, let me ask you what turned around the Canadian regulators. I mean, what argument did you make? Why did they approve a Bitcoin ETF this time around? I know there were several issues with them, just like there were several issues with the SEC uh, here in the United States. Um, sh should investors have access to this investment? Is it appropriate for them was one issue. Could it trade efficiently? And then there was that whole custody question they still have in the U.S. Uh, could it be done in a regulated manner? Um, were, were those issues addressed? Were you able to cure them? What did you tell them to convince them to, to approve it? Well, you know, first and foremost, I think, you know, if you go back to sort of 2017, 2018, when the first batch of Bitcoin filings, ETF filings came out, a large part of the struggle was, is the industry accepting of this as an asset class? And I think, you know, the regulators were really struggling with that question for a lot of the kind of, this was still an early stage asset, you know, that hadn't been fully proven out, very retail oriented, was institutional interest in there. But the bigger real point was was the infrastructure there. And I think, you know, frankly, as I, I think I've told you, I think that um, the infrastructure wasn't there in 2017. And, and you know, I think if they had gone about and improved these products back then, they wouldn't have um, it wouldn't have worked out well, I think. But a lot has changed in the last three plus years around the cult, the plumbing. Uh, when you talk about custodial elements, I mean, today you have real institutional quality and regulated custodians. You have um, futures market that just wasn't really there a number of years ago, but today is now a heavily traded and very liquid market from a market maker's perspective and a liquidity perspective. There's the ability for uh, market makers to now you know, directly trade in the Bitcoin market as opposed to only using the futures market. So there's so much plumbing that has been built into this space in the last number of years. And I think that from a regulatory perspective, you were able to address, and we were able to address with the Canadian regulators, those key hurdles, those key questions over the last couple of months. And then the, the real question of, was there acceptance? And I think that has, you know, for the most part, you know, changed. I think people have recognized that Bitcoin is a real asset. Uh, it's a real uh, security that people, you know, should have access to. And frankly, they're going to go and have access to it regardless of if it's in a regulated way or a non-regulated way and might as well, in my opinion, get it in a regulated way. And, and I think that's what the Canadian regulators saw. And can you describe the mechanics of this? How does this operate? Are you going to physically go out and buy Bitcoin and hold it yourself directly? Can can you do creations? Can you do in-kind creations? Th those kinds of things. How does this work mechanically? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And, and look, as I said, there's 
a fair amount of work that had to go into getting this uh, to where it is. I'm just even, you know, being the first to be able to do so. So um, first and foremost is these are going to be uh, what I say backed by real Bitcoin. So there's no futures, there's no notes or anything like that. So so we are actually owning every dollar invested in the ETF will be backed by a dollar of Bitcoin in our cold wallets. Um, the, the principle there is cold wallet. So as you know, in, in the digital asset base, yeah, I really have to kind of start thinking about the custody in a different way because you're dealing with a security that um, is, you know, kind of movable in different ways. So we use uh, a cold wallet uh, custody solution with Gemini. Um, that enables, that's actually the unique element of what we've done. So we don't have to actually store a large part of our, any part of our uh, Bitcoin in hot wallets, which is where you have the risk of, you know, potential um, hacking or, or risk of, you know, it not being secure for you. Um, and then the principle there was then how do you get the fluidity for daily activity, daily trading, buying and selling within the the, 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 the security. So we worked with our market makers, with our custodian and with our, I'll call it uh, broker dealers, trading agents, ensuring the ability to execute this. And you know, what doesn't get lost on this, Bob, is that we are dealing with a digital asset that effectively settles instantaneously. And then, of course, the, the regular ETF in the, in the market, security market, to trades in a T plus one or T plus three settlement. And managing those gaps yeah. is a really important part of this. And, and you know, some of the stuff that our team has really built uh, into this. Yeah. Andrew, let me just turn to you. I wonder, you're, you're an observer of all of this for many years. Yeah. What, if any, effect is this going to have on the prospects for a Bitcoin ETF in the United States. I mean, we, you and I have discussed this for years now. The SEC made it pretty clear to everybody in the last couple of years, they're not going to approve a Bitcoin ETF unless, number one, you address the issues of market manipulation around prices. They said they couldn't get their head around the way the right. Bitcoin prices on some of these exchanges, particularly overseas exchanges, number one. And number two, issues around uh, custody around the, the wallets getting stolen and other issues right. around custody. D how do you feel about all this? Do you well, think this that is, this is why a Bitcoin ETF, ETF has made progress? Yeah, yeah, I, I think it has. I'm going to take I'm going to take everybody out of the weeds a little bit here. Those are good technical things that we want, obviously, our listeners to learn. But I'll, I'll take you, you know, right right out of the weeds to the basics here. So first of all, Sam, congratulations. Um, that's quite an accomplishment. I think it's great partnering with Gemini is great, Bob. There's big players in the ETF world making these moves. Dave Abner used to run Wisdom Tree Europe. He's over at Gemini. He's an ETF guy, so he understands the plumbing. Remember, good ETFs throughout the last two decades solve problems. This Bitcoin ETF and the future U.S. ETF is going to solve a problem, right? And that is the plumbing, just like he said. Do you want to take on the plumbing yourself? You certainly don't want as a retail. And if you're running a treasury fund for a state, you don't want to take on the plumbing yourself either. That's the whole point of the ETF. The ETF is going to manage the plumbing, both from a regulatory and a seamless standpoint. Commenting on the Canadian ETF, so just going back to that first point, we will be able to access that Canadian ETF for our institutional clients. Now, everyone should know there is going to be a currency layer on top of that, right? You can't buy and settle in U.S. dollars a Canadian listed product. So there's going to be a currency big there. You know, good brokers will do a good job at minimizing that. It's something to be away from if you trade foreign ETFs. That's part of it. As far as it coming to the, U the, the U.S., I think this is going to lay the groundwork. Again, a lot of people don't want to do the legwork to figure out what is good. They want to hire an expert, right? His firm and the subsequent U.S. firm that launches this is going to be the portfolio manager of the fund, right? It's not just a tool. So you're going to rely on their expertise to kind of to, to move those things along. And the plumbing has come a long way. When we talked about it a few years ago, you know, market makers weren't involved. As, as popularity increases, the spreads allow market makers to figure out how to make markets in these underlying coins, and they're going to do it. And, of course, it's going to mitigate single stock risk. I, I'd be interested to have a question, single coin risk, excuse me. I'd be interested to have a question what other coins it's going to hold. I'm sure a subsequent U.S. one would not just be all Bitcoin. And if it holds the other coins, then it's really going to be successful because it's hard for the investor to choose outside of Bitcoin and Ethereum. I have to be long Ethereum. Yeah. Which ones really mean anything? That's right. So this is just so this just holds Bitcoin, right? That's right. So this is just a pure play, so, 100 percent Bitcoin. Uh, and we think that that's a, an important product first to bring. Um, I, think, I do think that there's an opportunity to bring, you know, an Ether strategy or other th things like that. And I'm not as big a fan of bringing a multi-coin uh, asset at this stage. I think there's a more exciting things to do in decentralized finance and other things like that. But I think this is, for us, the two main coins that I think are really interesting are Bitcoin and then subsequently maybe an Ether. Yeah, and Bob, it just adds, okay. remember, Christian, it adds I want a regulated ticker so people can feel comfortable trading it versus opening a Coinbase account. Right. That's why it's going to be a success. Sure. 
No, I agree with your point that an average investor doesn't want to deal with all the plumbing issues. And that is a major problem for Bitcoin. Bitcoin.